Hey guys, hope y'all are doing well. Um, before we get started, let's pray. Father, I praise you for what you're doing in this moment, what you're about to do in this moment, Lord. Um, Lord, I just pray that you permeate my words with your, with, with your blessing, oh God. I pray that you um, minister to every single heart in, in a different way today. And I pray that as you teach us, as you lead us to take back the tools, God, I pray that we will just use, use this sermon for our betterment, Lord. Speak to me, speak through me. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, so guys, this sermon, thank you for joining me today. Uh, this sermon is called Taking Back the Tools. A few weeks ago, I, I think it's about a month ago now, I did a part, um, two-part uh, sermon series called Toolbox. And in there, I talked about... Um, Things like social media, money, and, and other stuff being tools. Um, and the Lord really ministered to me again about taking back the tools. So, I'm an English person. Um, not just that I speak English, but that I love English. And... Um, I love to define things if I'm going to um, uh, speak about them. I don't always define things, but when I'm speaking about them uh, at length, I like to define them. So I looked up at, um, on the world word tools, and I will read the definitions that I found um uh, on Webster's Diction Marion Webster's Dictionary dot com. So just let me get that up, and then we can get started. You know, I found it so interesting. Totally off topic. While I get the the thing up, um, I found it so interesting that Merriam-Webster's has been around since 1828. So that means it's been around for hundreds of years. And today, as I was looking for the definition of tools, I saw the word, <laughs> I saw one of the definitions that I'm not going to use. They said, a a very not nice person and they said that person's a tool and I thought that's in the dictionary that's so cool how words evolve and change and stuff it's so cool it really is um I love words I've always loved words I've loved English I've loved story um <laughs> I'm just killing time here um so that's, it was kind of cool. The longevity of Webster's Dictionary, 1828, and I was thinking, wow, I wonder what it would have looked like. I would love to get a copy of Webster's first dictionary and see the words that they used back then. And that we don't use now, I think it would be a lot of them. That would be that would be a great thing to do. Um, so here we go. Uh, the definition of tools. Um, this is the first definition I found. A handheld device that aids in accomplishing a task. 
and and the second definition is something such as such as an instrument or apparatus used to perform use sorry such uh, something such as an instrument or apparatus used in performing an operation or necessary in practicing a vacation, a profession. Uh, and the example they give here, a scholar's books are his tools. So judging from those definitions, um, tools are, um, used in completing a task, that's one thing, and they're used for, they're used for completing a bit, a vocation, or a profession. So, um, if, as the body of Christ, he's given us, um, the kingdom to manage and to steward, he said, I've given you the keys to the kingdom, um, is it? Doesn't it stand to reason then that um, we have to use the the tools that he's given us to practice uh, what we've been, been given? Uh, the the Lord when we're born, I would argue at conception, the Lord has given us each tools, um, certain parts of our personality, certain uh, parts of our um, makeup to use for his glory. And some of us are just uh, using them haphazardly. Um, and he wants us to take it back, to take it back, and not only our personal tools, but the tools outside of us, like the tools that the world has come up with. He wants us to bring it back into the church, which, which means tools like social media. Uh, now, I've heard a lot of preachers say that um, social media is a bad thing, and it's not a bad thing, but a very dangerous thing when it comes to comparison and all of that. I was talking to the Lord about that, by the way, and he said, it depends on what you come there to do. So, if you come to YouTube, uh, or, uh, like, looking for the hottest, um, bad diets, or looking to see who's doing what, or if you come to Facebook or Instagram um, with those negative thoughts and with those comparison things, you'll find them. He said something to me very clever. He said, God said to me, you'll find what you're looking for. And I heard someone say um, recently, I heard someone say, um, this week you, you can, you get, you got off of YouTube and thought, 
oh, what a wonderful experience and blah, blah, blah. And he said it in kind of a joking, intercastic way. You know? And I got up and, and I said, well, ex uh, well, I did because that was what I was looking for when I came to Facebook, when I came to you, YouTube. You find what you're looking for. So if you're looking for, if you're mentally s scrolling to see com comparison and whatever, you'll find it. And if you are scrolling to be encouraged, to be, um, to be enriched by something on Facebook, you'll find it. You'll honestly find what you're looking for. If you want to find encouragement and God's word on Facebook, you can find it. If you want to find discouragement and bad news, you can find it. It all is about what you come there to find. And he's saying, he's saying to me so clearly, he's saying, tell the church to take back the tools. Take back the tools of your life. Take back the tools of yourself. Take the tools I have given you. Take back the tools that were invented um, and use them for my glory. And he's saying, because every church has a YouTube channel now, most um, uh, what they call, although I hate the term, mega churches do, most people most people do have, have a YouTube channel, but my thing is, what's the purpose? You have to have a purpose. You have to have a reason why you're there. And then he said, you need to take it back. Instead of ignoring it and saying, I'm not going to go on there. That's the devil's playground. Well, change it. Change it. If you think it's the devil's playground, and if you see people being mean and and uh, uh, ornery, and you see people being just awful, using it for aw awfulness, use it for good. Start campaigns when, like, I don't know, start a revolution. Like, I just... I just think of Paul and how Paul, um, he was kind of, for those of you who really don't know who Paul was, he was what we would call now a church planter. What he would do is after his experience um, with, he was like, um, let me go back. He was kind, Paul was kind of like, uh, he wasn't a rich guy, but he was um, taught by all these, uh, uh, what we would call now influencers or kind of celebrities or uh, he, he sat at the, he, he gleaned from all these uh, people, all these influencers of the day, and then he he was a staunch atheist. He was a very learned man. He was he was so smart, but he was a staunch atheist until um, he was on this road one day called Damascus. And the Lord kind of knocked him literally off his horse. And I should say about Paul, he was such an atheist. He was actually uh, killing Christians because uh, he was a he was a Gentile, but he was actually killing Christians. So. And the Lord, like, kind of literally knocked him off his horse. And he had a wonderful experience. And 
in that experience, he became a Christian. And not only did he become a Christian, he he became a church planter. So what he would do, he would go to a city um, near, uh, he would go to cities all around Asia Minor and and start churches and then when he would start churches start little home uh, churches uh, he would instill ministers and then move on and then the new half the New Testament other than the Gospels most of the New Testament is uh, made up of books of Paul. And all these books, like Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and all of those books, Romans, were written uh, to the churches that he started. So when he started a church and moved on, he would write letters to the churches that he started. Because I guess he got updates from his uh, campus pastors or uh, the, pa the ministers that he uh, instilled there, uh, installed there to pastor the people and to guide the people and to shepherd the people. I guess he got updates on how they were doing. And so from those updates, he would write letters to them. Uh, he would write all those letters. So that's where Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, Romans, and all of those um, books come from, except Timothy and Philemon. Timothy and Philemon uh, were not churches. They were actually uh, people that he was mentoring, especially uh, Timothy uh, and Titus, too. Um, especially Timothy. Timothy was some... some was a young pastor and he was mentoring him in the faith. And uh, so as, as I was thinking about Paul and social media, I was thinking, what would Paul do with Facebook? And how would Paul, what pictures would Paul post on Instagram, you know? Um, and I was thinking, wh he would just, he would just go crazy with this. He would love this. He wouldn't shy away from it. He would, I think he would, um, infiltrate it. So what the church needs to do, um, what pastors need to do instead of backing away from it, infiltrate it. And don't just have your church up there for a live service um, or whatever. Find something to do that will change the, tra the trajectory of it. If you don't like something, don't back away from it. Change it. That's what Jesus did. And that's why they killed him. Because... Jesus came down not only to die, not only to die for our sins, but to show us how to live. His teachings were to show us how to live. He didn't, he didn't like what was going on at, um, in the world, so he changed it. He taught. He healed. He, he did stuff. He was, he was the biggest d disturber anywhere. He just upset the whole religious system. He didn't like it, so he changed it. Paul, Paul had this amazing experience, and 
had to share it. So he he started ministering, going from town to town, and and um, raising up churches and planting churches and developing ministers and pastors. And through that, he he got in trouble. He was in jail several times because they didn't like what he was doing. But he still continued to do it. And at the end of Paul's life, he said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. And Paul never gave up. He didn't say, oh, Lord, this is too hard. Let me back away. No, he got stronger. And I, and I totally believe this. I totally believe that instead of backing away from tools, instead of uh, backing away from social media, we need to infiltrate it. And I'm talking about more than having clips up or whatever, having uh, your, your church up like twice a week or whatever. I'm talking about turning this thing upside down. And I think if churches and if people can decide that, you know, we are taking this thing back. We are not letting the devil do what he wants with our minds. And I think um, that if you can find a way to change the trajectory of what's going on, it'll change the world. If you can, you know, if you can um, find a way to encourage instead of discourage. And, and I'm not so talking about just the cutesy scripture or whatever. I'm talking about just fighting fighting the way God would fight against uh, bullying, against harassment, against all this stuff. And taking what the devil meant for evil and turning it around for good. Joseph said to his brothers, what you meant for evil, God meant, God is going to turn it around for good. And I'm seeing so much about, about technology prophetically. I can't even explain all the stuff I'm seeing about technology prophetically. Um... I think um, that if we can take the tools back, not only for the church, but in our own lives, God, I'm going to switch from the church to our own lives now. God has given us tools, tools that we can use, our words that we can use, our skills that we can use for his glory but we're using them for to to spawn evil and he's saying i need you to take those tools back from the devil and use them for for me i need you to take those skill sets that you use nine to five and use them for the kingdom He's like, I've given you the, that skill set of finances. I've given you that skill set of medicine. I've given you that skill set of words to use for me. He's like, I need you to give it back to me. And it, and it is not um, just me doesn't, doesn't mean in the church on a Sunday. Me means... Um, new ministry ideas, uncommon ministry ideas, using your gifts and using your talents and using what he has given you. He's saying, I've given you those tools. Give them back to me. He's saying, I need those tools because the tools that you have, there are people that need them. 
there are people that are desperately needing the tools that you have, but you're, but you're silent about it. He's saying it's time for you to come out of the closet, for you to open that mouth and use that tools, those tools. Some of you have gifts for preaching, but you're too afraid to uh, speak up. And you're too afraid. You're like, well, I'm not good enough. Well, I got news for you, honey. Nobody's good enough. Like I said a few days ago, put your nothing put your nothing on his everything and it will come, become beyond something. I'll say that again. Put your nothing on his everything and it will become beyond something. Because if you don't give it to him to use, how can he use it? You're saying, use me, Lord, use me, Lord. And he's saying, are you sure? Because how he's going to use you is not, is not the way you think. And when I say use you, I don't mean in a bad way like people use people and throw them away. No, he's going, I mean, he's going to take your gift and make it more than you could ever dream. So my definition of use is when God takes your gift and and makes it more than you could ever dream, put your natural in his super hands and, and it will become supernatural. I just want you to use those tools. Take those tools back. Instead of laughing at mean Facebook stuff, create something, or trying to get into a nasty fight with a relative or whatever, create something that can, that can contribute in a positive way to people's lives. If, if we can infiltrate Facebook with positivity, if we could infiltrate Instagram with not just cute scripture verses, but real positivity, develop challenges like love over, um, send, send two hugs uh, to people that are discouraged today, or, you know, leave food on people's doorstep. If we can create, through social media, fun challenges and all of that, all the bad stuff will seem like, whatever, there's good and bad everywhere. But, um, all the bad stuff will seem like, uh, no big, not no big deal, but all the bad stuff we won't have the power that it does. And I'll say this again before I sign off. You find what you're looking for. So if you come to Facebook and you're looking and you're even mentally looking for the negative, you'll find it. If you come to Facebook and you're looking for the positive, you'll find it. So you'll find what you're looking for. Same thing with YouTube, same thing with Instagram. Be an encouragement to someone in social media. Start challenges that promote love and forgiveness and kindness and put up videos that promote love and forgiveness and kindness. You know, start fun challenges that you say, uh, I don't know, that comes out that come out of what you've gone through, challenge other people to be kind to, uh, to people, to be, to be, to be more loving to people. 
and you'll see what will happen. We, we can turn this social media thing around. We can make it a place of po positivity where God is praised. And not only through, like, putting, seeing churches put, put their stuff up. I'm saying to create something new and wonderful, like, to challenge people to do new and wonderful things through social media and turn it into a place of positivity where the negativity is not as powerful because what you focus on gets the power. What you make bigger, what you focus on gets bigger. What you ignore gets smaller. So if we begin to focus on the positivity in social media, um, the, the negative stuff will get smaller. The reason why the negative stuff is getting bigger is because that's what we're focused on and that's what we come for. I refuse to believe that, that this tool that I'm on right now wasn't created for good. It may not have been created for good, but God can use it. God is using it for good, and he wants to use it for even more good. So I think instead of shying it away from it, let's, let's um, infiltrate it with positivity. The more negative posts you see, put up something positive, put up something to encourage and go beyond the cutesy quote. It's time, church, to be creative. It's time to use those skills to be creative. And if we can each do that, we can turn this social media thing upside down that the, that the world or the people who don't know Christ will say, what is going on? I just feel something. I don't know what it is. But something great is happening here. I love this site. And this is turning into a place of encouragement for me. We can do it. We will do it. If we have the determination and the... If we say to ourselves that the devil is not going to take away this tool and use it for bullying or for putting people down or for insulting people. We're going to infiltrate it with love. We are going to infiltrate it with pos positivity and not just church announcements and not just cute church, cute church posts or sermon posts. All of that is good, but the Lord's saying, really clearly, I need you to use your creativity in this space of social media. There are things that you haven't even tapped in yet, tapped into yet. He's like, I need you to pray and get down on your knees to understand how this tool is supposed to be used. Like I said before, a tool can be used for good or for bad. A tool is not good or bad. It's benign. Like I said before, as an example, you can use a hammer to build beautiful houses to give family homes, or you can use a hammer to kill people. It's a tool. So you decide how you use it. And pastors, you decide how your church will use it. And he's like, he's like, the Lord is like to me right now, think bigger than you've ever thought before.
and I'm going to say that again. Think bigger than you've ever thought before. And he's like, don't be afraid of it. He's like, both to churches and to individual people, think bigger than you've ever thought before and do not be afraid. Yes, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for your word today, Jesus. I bless you. And I love you. You deserve the glory, Lord God. And I, I'm just honored that you've given me this word. And I just am so just astounded by your grace and by your love and by your kindness towards us, God. And Lord, I declare that social media will no longer be a place where the devil plays, but it will be a place where you reign. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, guys. So, I will see you soon. Bye. We're rest in the city, we're rest in the field, we're rest when we come, when we go. And the Lord wants me to say one more thing. Stop letting fear stifle your destiny. Stop letting fear stifle your faith and your destiny. There is somebody out there, God has given you wonderful things to do on social media, wonderful things to do with the gifts, but you're letting the fear of what if this doesn't work out stifle. You're letting the fear of what if stifle you. And the Lord said, do not let fear stifle you. Let faith propel you. He says to someone, he says, I know you're afraid, but I will be with you every step, but I need you to trust me and take one step. He says, you're not crazy. You're not crazy. You're Christ-like. Because when I think of Jesus, he was so radical. We think of Jesus as this cutesy person, but he was just so radical. He came into a time where people were just so religious and they had their own views about how the Messiah would come. And all these different sects of, of Jewish people had um, their views of how the Messiah would come. And the Messiah came, blew their minds, came in a manger and started uh, teaching and preaching all this stuff. And what what I love about Jesus' ministry is he never preached or taught in a church. He never preached or taught in the synagogue. He was always outside um, preaching and teaching. And what he was saying was so radical that they killed him for it. He allowed he allowed them to uh, to kill him for it because so that we can be rescued. But that doesn't negate the fact that that they killed him for being radical. And he's saying to the church today, he's saying, be radical. 
he's saying be radical and I'm just so grateful that he's uh, using these tools and it's so amazing and so awesome that he's um, that he's speaking so wonderfully today. He's saying, don't be afraid to be radical. He's saying, don't be afraid to look like an assured, saved, and sanctified fool. It's just so wonderful when I think about it. When I think of what God is going to do and what he's already doing, we don't even know. I can't tell you what I'm seeing in my head when it comes to um, technology and what what he's going to do in the next couple of years. I have no idea why he's showing this to me, but he knows and he knows where he's taking me. And I just say, whatever, Lord, I'm here for whatever you want me to do. And it's so wonderful when I think about it. So guys, thank you for joining me today. I know this one is a little long, but God had a lot of things to say today, and I'm so grateful. Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen, 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 I'll see you. I'll see you later, guys. Bye. Be radical. Be radical and fearless and know that he's got you. Every step you take, he will be with you. Not only watching you, but he will take it with you. And if necessary, he will carry you. But all you need to do is step out. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. Thank you, Jesus, for your kindness. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace to death. Amen.